کشته سم جفا شد خاتم پیغمبران کشته سم جفا شد خاتم پیغمبران از غم هستی رها شد خاتم پیغمبران There were many attempts on the Prophet's life. Uh, every war that's been waged against a Muslim, uh, you could say, was an attempt on the Prophet's life. But the most famous uh, attempt on the Prophet's life was when he left uh, Mecca in the middle of the night and headed towards Medina, um, where he ordered Imam Ali salam to sleep in his bed. And uh, he left in the middle of the night. Uh, he was accompanied by Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr decided to join him. And they, they ran and they were being chased out of, uh, they were being followed because they went to the Prophet's house to assassinate him. They found Imam Ali in his bed and they said, oh, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib, this is not Rasulullah. So they went looking for him and, and they found the trail and they followed the trail into the, um, the mountains, into the caves. And this is where uh, the spider, uh, you know, was, um, made a web and the people saw the web and thought, okay, if he had gone through here, the web would have broken, so he's not been there. Um, and so this was an attempt on the Prophet's life. So it's not the first time people have tried to kill the Prophet. The question arises that why would people want to kill the Prophet? Well, first of all, you have to understand that the Prophet was seen as a revolutionist, someone who was rebelling against society and was causing a change in the social hierarchy. Obviously, people had a way of life and had a set of beliefs, and those set of beliefs were making them a lot of money. The Kaaba was full of idols, people all over the world would come to Mecca to worship these idols and to do tawaf and spend money. That's been turned around now. All those idols have been smashed. Now, people who used to make idols have lost out on their business. People who would make money off the pilgrims that were coming to Mecca are not making as much money now because Obviously, the idols aren't being sold, um, dresses and clothes aren't being bought. And now this person called Muhammad has created this new religion, a new religion that has one God, a new religion that has um, equality, has social equality, has um, man and woman seen as equals and given them proper responsibilities and proper code of conduct. And this is seen as a threat to the upper class in Mecca. This is seen as a threat to uh, the upper class of, of the pagans and, and those who were benefiting from the previous religions are not benefiting anymore, are not making as much money. And they saw their traditional ways, they saw their culture, and they saw their business collapse in front of Rasulullah. And this is why they did whatever they could to stop the propagation of Islam and to stop this Islamic movement and to take the life of Rasulullah There were some attempts on killing Rasulullah that historians agree upon. One of them is on his way back from the Battle of Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk occurred in the year 9 after Hijrah and it is the last battle the Prophet participated in himself. He went with the Muslims and he took about 30,000 Muslims with him. It was a big battle because the Roman Caesar had lined up his forces across the boundaries of the Islam, you know, the Islamic area or the Islamic state at the time. So the Prophet ﷺ leaves with all Muslims, leaving Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib ﷺ in Medina. Every time the Prophet left Medina, he would leave someone and appoints him as a successor until he kind of comes back or at least appoints him not as a successor but maybe more accurately as a leader until he comes back. The dynamics in the year 9 after Hijrah were such that the hypocrites in Medina were really cooking a lot of things up. They started establishing what the Quran refers to as Masjid al -Dhirar. Masjid al they built just across from Masjid Quba. And the idea that they had for building it in front of the Muslims, they said Masjid Quba is a small masjid. Masjid Quba is the first masjid that the Prophet ﷺ established in Islam. 
They said, it's a small masjid. Now the Muslims have increased in numbers. We're going to build a bigger masjid and one with better roofing, you know, more space. That was the excuse they came up. However, the real essence of Masjid Dhirar was to make it as a spying cell. It is not inside Medina, so people cannot really see them. And it's not that far away from Medina. So they, th they thought this was a strategic place for them to keep this, you know, sp um, operational uh, spying agency. The Prophet ﷺ knew of this, but he did not get the opportunity and the time to deal with it. So he had to leave it and to go to Tabuk. So the hypocrites of Medina now are cooking. And all these hypocrites were people who used to be with Rasulullah ﷺ. These were people who, for example, used to even pray next to Rasulullah ﷺ or with Rasulullah ﷺ. So these were people who on the outside, they're Muslims. And that's why we cannot say that all those people who were with the Prophet ﷺ were infallible. All those people who were with the Prophet ﷺ were genuine. So the Prophet had to leave Medina. Now he could not leave Medina in the hands of someone who is weak. Or someone who does not have a good strategy. Or someone who does not have good essence of politics. Or someone who does not have really good command of faith and religion. The only person who unites all these factors was Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi. So when he leaves Imam Ali, then it is as if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi himself is there. Because the ayah of the Quran, wa anfusana wa anfusakum, ourselves and yourselves. Imam Ali is the essence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The hypocrites knew that every time the Prophet leaves to a battle, Imam Ali is always with him. They never even thought that the Prophet would leave Ali ibn Abi Talib salam behind. So the Prophet leaves Imam Ali behind. And now when they saw that, they became very upset because their whole plans failed. Now they knew they cannot do anything with Ali ibn Abi Talib salam being there. And there's that famous hadith because the hypocrites started cooking up some rumors that, you know, the Prophet left Ali because he doesn't like him or because the war is so intense and he left Ali with the women and the children. So Imam Ali السلام, came up just after the Prophet you know, had just departed Medina. So he came up with him to him, uh, cat caught up to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what the people in Medina are saying. He said, don't worry about what they're saying. And this hadith is mentioned, just this part of the hadith says, you are to me like Harun is to Musa, except there is no Prophet after me. This part of the hadith is mentioned even on Sahih al-Bukhari. And the Imam then goes back to uh, Medina. That hadith was heard by people when the Prophet told you are to me like Aaron was to Moses or Harun was to Musa. Harun was the successor of Musa. Ukhlufni, the Prophet Musa tells Harun. So people heard that, oh, wait a minute. This is now officially, he's kind of, or at least semi-officially, he's declaring Ali as the successor. So the Prophet leaves to the Battle of Tabuk. Imam Ali stays in Medina. He goes, and by that year, the year 9 after Hijrah, we're talking about after the conquest of Mecca. With the conquest of Mecca, that same year in the, eight, the year 8 after Hijrah, also happened the Battle of Hunayn, where al taif was also taken, uh, taken care of. al taif and Mecca were both what we call today superpowers. When Muslims manage to take over these superpowers, it means that Islam now is dominant. So the hypocrites who had maybe some planning or plots to gain power now saw this as the best opportunity. Islam is now dominating. That's it. Now it's the time to take the reins in our hands. So with the Prophet ﷺ going to Tabuk, and Alhamdulillah, the Muslims, you know, by the time they arrived at the borders, the Caesar, the Roman Caesar, had withdrew his forces, so the people got scared. His people got scared. And the Prophet asked the Muslims, would you want to go inside? Should we chase them? Should we go inside and fight? Or should we just move back? They said, Ya Rasulullah, since we scared them away, and it's really hot, it's difficult, so let's go back. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed with them. But what that established is those small communities who had allies with the Roman Caesar, they broke their allies with the Roman and they established allies with the Prophet
This allies is extremely important, this alliance, because it showed the power of Muslims. These people, even though they may not have come under, uh, like they did not turn to Islam as a religion, however, they turned to Islam as a protection. So they came under the umbrella. These alliances showed the dominance of Islam, the strength of Islam and the Muslims. The Prophet then starts heading back to Medina. They come across an area where the Prophet says, I'm going to take a route with Ammar and Hudayfa. They will be with me, Ammar ibn Yasir and Hudayfa. The rest of the Muslims take a different route. And I will see you at a well. There is a well up there. And why did the Prophet take that route? How come? Why did he kind of break away from the Muslims? Maybe he wanted to demonstrate to the Muslims that there are those who are plotting his killing because that's when the problem happened. So the Prophet ﷺ keeps continues on his journey with Ammar and Hudayfa on his path. All of a sudden at night, 14 or 16 masked men, you know, they, they covered their faces, come and their intention was to push the camel of the Prophet ﷺ into the valley. So the Prophet gets killed. The prophets gets killed people would say that you know what he got killed some people attacked him since he did not really declare anyone as his successor therefore we're going to have an election and a vote and i guess there was a plan or a plot i should say to kind of take the khilafah these people come interestingly nobody knew that the prophet had taken this route except those muslims who were with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So the Prophet takes this route. These 12, 14, 16 men came out. They started fighting with Ammar and Hudayfa, and they defended Rasulullah fiercely that these 14 men or 16 men ran away. They, their plan failed. The Prophet asked Ammar and Hudayfa, Did you see who they were? They said, Ya Rasulullah, it was dark, plus they had their faces covered. The Prophet then calls upon Hudayfa and he says, Ya Hudayfa, do you want me to tell you their names, but with the condition that you never mention their names to anyone? It's a secret. He said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet whispers their, name, their names in his ear. And hence, Hudayfa became known as the carrier of the secret of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And interestingly, they used to say that whenever there was a death of one of the people of Medina, People say we would want to see if Hudayfa attends the Salatul Mayyit. If he attends, it means this person was not a hypocrite. If he doesn't show up, they start having a doubt because he knows who the hypocrites are. So that is an assassination attempt against Rasulullah The Prophet knew who these people were. And apparently they were from these Muslims. We can say from an investigation point of view, that all Muslims are guilty, or at least they're all suspect. They're all suspect, with the exception of Ammar and Hudayfa, because they were with Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi, they were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and Ali ibn Abi Talib also because he was in Medina. With the exception of these three, all Muslims are suspects, because they were all in this army. Okay. The interesting thing is, one of those Muslims one day, after the left departure of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, a few years later comes and asks Hudayfa, Hudayfa, am I one of those people? Did the Prophet mention my name? The question is, why would he ask? If he, you know, was sure that he was not one of them, why would he ask? Why would he come to Hudayfa? And Hudayfa replied, I'm sorry, I told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I promised him I would never break the secret. This incident is mentioned in most of the books of history. Tariq, uh, Sirat ibn Husham, Sirat ibn Husham, Tariq al-Tabari. This hadith is mentioned in these references. People of history, I mean, just look up. Look up the assassination of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the Battle of Tabuk. Or an attempt to assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the Battle of Tabuk. And you'll see the story. So there has been attempt by some hypocrites or some individuals to assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And therefore, it may not be a surprise that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died in unnatural ways, maybe by giving poison. 
for example. So Rasulullah used to fall ill uh, simply because his immune system needed developing and building. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow for him to get ill so that his immune system would go up, so that his body could develop. For example, you can't expect an infallible when he's born as a child to have a fully grown body or muscles or developed body to uh, human perfection. It doesn't work like that. It has to go through stages just like we, uh, just like normal human beings. Uh, same with the Imam, the Imma, and also with the Prophet Rasulullah As he was growing, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to get ill a lot more frequently for him to build his immune system stronger than an ordinary human being. So he was, he, the Rasulullah used to get ill in order for his body to progress and for him to build his immune system to be greater than an ordinary human being. Do we have any evidences or any examples? Of course, the famous du'a Joshin al-Kabir. If you read Joshin al-Kabir and read the history behind it, why was that du'a there? What did it come for? The du'a was there when Rasulullah was at war and he put on this armour. The armour was so heavy and the Rasulullah, he felt ill. He, he, put, he put it on and it was heavy. He couldn't move properly. Uh, it was extremely heavy. It was extremely difficult for him physically to hold it that he started to get fevers he started to lose strength he started to get ill and then this dua came down in order for him to uh, recite in order for him to recover and to strengthen his body in order for him to wear that armor for war not to also forget that every time rasulullah sallallahu alaihi felt the wahi when revelation was delivered to him he would say it was like a loud ringing bell. He would have, um, you have to understand that this is nur, this is knowledge of the heavens entering his heart. He had to be very physically strong and he'd be like this and he'll break out into sweats, he'll break out into fevers. Sometimes they say he even used to ha like have little fits or something, he'd be on the floor trying to uh, contain this knowledge, this nur that was entering his heart. Um, which also caused him to feel ill at times. But the more and more it happened, the stronger and stronger he got. So yeah, it's not a surprise to us that the Prophet fell ill at all. In today's world, many Muslims know very little about the history of their Prophet. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him and his pure family. And they don't know much about his assassination or being killed or did he die a natural death. Let's pay attention to the verses in the Holy Quran. In Surah Al Imran, verse one four four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Wama Muhammadun illa Rasul now, the Quran says, and Muhammad, peace be upon and spirit family, is but a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him. If he dies or is killed, you will turn back on your hills. Now let's stop on the section If he died or killed. Now the conjunctive or أو in Arabic has two meanings. The or, either it means uncertainty, to be unsure of something. So if, if I say tomorrow I will go to the mosque or to do some shopping, for example. So I'm not sure tomorrow am I going to go to the mosque or to the shopping. But in Arabic, there's another meaning for the conjunctive or, which means 
rather bal so in this holy verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not have any uncertainty or he's not unsure because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's the creator and he knows about everything inside out so it's impossible on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hesitate there's actually another verse in the Holy Quran in the Surah As-Safat, verse 147, Allah says with regard to the story of Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, he says, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَى مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ Again, Allah used the conjunctive أَوْ or. He says, and we sent him, Yunus alayhi salam, to a hundred thousand or more or Yazidun or more now as we've cleared out the, the issue of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he won't be in a position of uncertainty and such things is away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the use of aw or here means rather and in Arabic means bal بَلْ يَزِيدُونَ It's hundred thousand, rather it's more. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything, all the accounts and the statistics of everything in this world. So it's forbidden Allah to be in the position of, of uncertainty. So he knows exactly how many people that he sent Yunus to, alayhi salam. So we come up with the conclusion on, this, on these verses that aw means rather. Afa'immata aw qutila, which means bal qutila, indeed he was killed. If he died, rather, indeed, surely he was killed. Now, how, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this type of um, uh, wordings instead of he would have said Qutila, he was killed straight away or it was with regard to Yunus alayhi salam it was 130,000 straight this is actually requires um, a special uh, research and lecture but um, in overall Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wise he knows why and where and how to use these uh, wordings and conjunctives. Now, we begin with the hadith of the non-Shia, Ahl-Sunnah, in other words, uh, with regard to the martyrdom of the Prophet We look at the example of, for ex uh, of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who reported that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, a well-known companion and a narrator in the time of the Prophet he reports the fact that he says, I am willing to take an oath nine times. For what? For what reason? That he's going to take oath, you know, swears to Allah nine times. For, for what reason? That the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family, was murdered. And this is mentioned in the Sunni sources. He was killed. Indeed, he was killed. And Ibn Mas'ud is uh, swearing to Allah or having the oath that he was murdered, he was killed. And then he says, but I'm not willing to take an oath even once that he was not killed. So, Clearly, this hadith tells us that there's a great possibility that the Prophet was assassinated. But the whole issue and the debate is about the how and where and why he was killed. Now we look at the, the scenario of the Ahlul Sunnah scholars with regard to the 
killing of the Prophet There are stories that the Prophet, after the Battle of Khaybar, in the seventh year of Hijrah, he was invited by a Jewish woman uh, for a banquet, to have a dinner. And she cooked meat and poisoned that meat. They invite the, the Prophet and his companions to come eat. Uh, she makes lamb and she poisons the lamb. The Prophet takes a bite from it and realizes that it's poisoned. He tells the companions not to eat from that lamb and he goes uh, away. He, he doesn't touch the lamb anymore. Um, and then years later, the poison has affected his uh, digestive system, has damaged his digestive system. And in the space of what, to, from 7th Hijrah to 11th Hijrah was when the Prophet departed. So four years, four and a half years, this uh, infection or this sort of, um, you know, medical um, uh, issue has caused the Prophet to die. Now, according to the Shia school of thought, number one, this didn't happen, okay? Uh, because no authentic narrations declare that this happened. Secondly, if it did happen, number one, we are not allowed to eat kosher meat. This is forbidden. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would not eat kosher meat. Um, thirdly, if it wasn't kosher and it was halal, then the lady who gave it was Muslim and not Jewish. And if she's a Muslim, why would she want to kill the Prophet? Uh, also, why and how can poison take up to four years, four and a half years to kill someone? It doesn't make sense. Uh, the Prophet being so strong, the Prophet being having such a uh, developed immune system, the Prophet having the most perfect diet, the most perfect health, someone who prescribes us to drink honey and milk you know, for our cures, someone who prescribes us to eat fruits, certain fruits, certain, certain veg, especially dates, for our health benefits, someone who's so health conscious and someone who's so healthy, how can such a poison take four years to actually kill him off. It doesn't make sense. If there was any poison that he did eat, he would have died within a week, two weeks. If it was, if it was strong enough to kill him, he would have died within days. If it was strong enough um, to cause damage, it would have caused damage, but the Prophet after that would have healed, right? The damage wouldn't have been permanent damage. He would have healed and he would have come back to normal as in 100% fit. And we know this because uh, he continued to lead the Muslims for another four and a half years. He traveled expeditions, there was other wars, there was physically he was fine, and there was no other complaint or no other uh, event that took place in that time that the Prophet had to, uh, or the Prophet referred to that event of being poisoned in Khaybar. For example, there's nothing to say the Prophet was gardening one day and was like, oh my stomach, oh my liver, oh that poison from Khaybar is doing it to me. And, you know, this happened a couple of months after Khaybar or this happened a couple of years after Khaybar. We don't have consistency in the Prophet complaining about uh, this poison and we don't have any f uh, hadith or any records of people being concerned about him being poisoned and asking him, how are you? What's going on? How, uh, you know, have you healed from the poison or, or is your stomach still like this? Have you healed from this or healed from that? There's nothing like that. There's no consistency of people being concerned. There's no consistency of the Prophet complaining about it. So it just doesn't add up. But the main thing is this, is that there's no such poison that takes four and a half years to kill someone. The poison would have gone in and out of the body within two, three weeks. You know, and it would have either killed him or it would have, uh, you know, caused like some severe damage that he wouldn't be able to live for a couple of months. He wouldn't have healed 100%, which the Prophet most likely did. Um, you know, uh, being devil's advocate, say most likely he did. It, well, it didn't ever happen. That's why he it wasn't, um, you know, uh, severely damaged uh, at all. But uh, if the poison had done something, the Prophet would have complained about it. There's no complaints, no consistency of complaints, no consistency of concerns from the Sahaba. And um, the worst of the worst would have been he dies, didn't die. The worst of the worst was in he lost some sort of organs or, or limbs. And that didn't happen either. And the best thing that would happen was that he healed 100% and lived a normal life, which he did. He lived a normal life. Therefore, either he was poisoned and he healed or he wasn't poisoned at all. There are times where history mentions 
there were attempts to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There is that famous incident, of course, when Quraysh tried to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he was still in Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him, saved him, and he went to Medina. When in Medina, Muslims do mention that at Khaybar, a Jewish lady tried to poison Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There is also an indication that another lady in Medina may have also attempted to poison Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, some Muslims mention, especially the Muslims who are not the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, that it is the poison that the Prophet put in his mouth from that lamb that the Jewish lady prepared in Khaybar is what really put its effect three years later in Rasulullah. We kind of neglect that kind of um, attempt and hadith, although they say, you know, the Prophet died shaheed, and it is the poison of that, the effect of that poison from Khaybar three years earlier. We say that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ did not demonstrate or display any signs of weakness during these three years. In fact, in the year eight after Hijrah, he went to the conquest of Mecca. Then he went and fought the Battle of Hunayn. Then he went with the Battle of Tabuk, which was a difficult battle. At least it was not difficult. They did not fight, but getting there, it was the heat of the summer. It was a tough time. So none of these instances do we find the Prophet Sallallahu demonstrating weakness, uh, hurt, pain. So all of a sudden, you know, in the year 10 after Hijrah, towards the end of his life, all of a sudden the effect of that poison kind of kicks in. That's why we, we find it difficult to accept such riwayat. However, we do have hadith from Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi who says, I will be poisoned just like my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He was asked by who? He says, by my wife, Ju'da. Okay. That is a hadith that we agree and accept that it is authentic. So according to this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, did not die a natural death, but rather he was poisoned. But the death of the Prophet ﷺ, according to the history of, of both sects, that the Prophet died on the 11th of Hijrah. Now this scenario can be easily refuted by two evidences. Firstly, the Battle of Khaybar took place on the 7th of Hijrah. And the supposed poisoning of the Prophet ﷺ by that Jewish woman was in that, in that year, after the battle. And the Prophet's demise and departure from this world was on the 11th of the Hijrah. Now, it cannot be really sensible and rational to accept the idea that a person who was poisoned and ate that poisoned food would remain healthy for the next four and a half years. Because between, between the, the year 7th and 11th, almost four and a half years. How could a person survive all that years without being uh, in a difficult health situation? So for this reason, we cannot accept the scenario from the Ahlul Sunnah, that he was killed due to the poison that the Prophet um, ate with that food and died four years later. Now, we also, we look at the battles of the Prophet after the seventh of Hijrah. He joined many battles. The Fatih Makkah was on the eighth year, exactly one year after the Battle of Khaybar. He went to, to Mecca uh, with, f with full health, good health, and he opened Mecca, he entered Mecca, he was on the horse or camel, proudly came back to Mecca, to his homeland, and then left Mecca back to Medina, and also joined other battles after the, the eighth of Hijrah. So what is the effects and the side effects of poison? So we cannot accept the scenario.
how could we trust somebody who fought Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, in the battle of Kamal, Harb al-Jamal, against her Imam of her time, Ali alayhi salam. The second evidence which will refute the scenario and the story is that Aisha herself, um, reported by Al-Bukhari, one of the most prominent scholars in the Sunni world, she says that Allah, Allah's Prophet told me on his deathbed that, oh Aisha, since I consumed that poison food after the, the Khaybar battle, I've been in pain. Since four years, he's been in pain. Now it is the time for my heart to stop beating because of that poison. The Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 5, page 137. Now, how could we accept, number one, the narrations of, of Aisha? It was one of those that is called in the ulum uh, of Hadith and Rijal, Hadith al-Ahad. It's only her who reported this Hadith. How could we trust her? Also, let us not to forget that the Holy Quran mentioned about Aisha and, and Hafsa that they're, they're the two wrongdoers. In Surah Al-Tahrim, Ayah 4, Allah says, إِن تَتُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ فَقَدْ صَغَتْ قُلُوبُكُمَا If you both turn to Allah repentance, then indeed your hearts are already inclined. Allah refused Aisha and Hafsa in, in this holy verse. How could we take the hadith from somebody whose heart has been inclined? Somebody who was rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a woman who was condemned from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the seven skies and threatened to be tortured in the hellfire. How could we take the hadith from her? So we, we refuse this hadith because it's, it's only a Aishi hadith. We cannot accept it. From the narrations that we have, did, was the Prophet poisoned? Yes, he was poisoned from the narrations. Not to do with Khaybar, but to do more with his wives. Uh, this is mentioned in Bahar Anwar where Hazrat Jibra'il, he comes, he speaks to uh, Rasulullah and he informs him that uh, Abu Bakr and Umar will seize the Khilafah from Imam Ali, they will take it from him, they will do this by killing yourself. Rasulullah then tells this to Hafsa, he tells Hafsa that this is what the angel has informed me of, angel Jibreel has told me of, she goes and speaks to um, Aisha and she speaks to Abu Bakr and her father and together they uh, plot and seize an opportunity to kill the Prophet because it's not the first time they're doing this as in people have been trying to kill the Prophet for a long time and also uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, not just Abu Bakr, Umar but many many of other companions especially people like the Umayyads, uh, people of high power that have lost out to Islam because their superior positions have now been removed because of Islam. They don't make as much money in, in the, in, as they used to uh, because of Islam, because of paganism has dropped. They don't have the same respect as they did before uh, because Islam has come and now they are seen as equals with slaves rather than being seen as uh, upper class. And furthermore, some of them had um, a life of poverty or a life of no respect or no honor and this was a great opportunity for them to take and to change their life for the rest or change their lives for the, the remainder of their time here on earth in quraysh there were some families that were known as the elites this is prior to islam of course there was what we can call today the caste system the upper class and the lower class. And in fact, if we may even say the no class. The elites, the upper class, they formed what we may call today like a club. 
It was known as Dar al Nadwa. Dar al Nadwa was a club, a social club where people would meet, these elites would meet, and they would take kind of make, make major decisions. Nobody was allowed to enter into Dar al Nadwa unless he belonged from one of those elite families, the upper class families. Among those upper class families that were well known in Quraysh were the Bani Umayyads. They were wealthy people, they were businessmen. For example, you have Abu Sufyan entering into this house or into this place. Bani Makhzum, Abu Jahl, Al Walid ibn Al Mughira. These guys were from the Makhzum families, the Makhzum tribe of Quraysh. They were allowed in because they were the wealthy people, rich people. Bani Hashim were allowed because they were the leaders of Quraysh. Again, they were the honorable ones. So you have these elites, these honorable people who would enter into this Dar al Nadwa. And in fact, this is the place where the elites met after the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and, and they made the decision to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this was the place where they used to meet. When Abu Talib alayhi, was alive, he would enter with them, but he had hides his faith. And that's why the Imams alayhi salam, say the similitude of Abu Talib is to that of the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun, the believer of Ali Fir'aun, Fir'aun's cousin, Hizqil, that he never displayed his true faith, and Abu Talib also never displayed his true faith. So Abu Talib would come inside Dar al Nadwa, listen to what these guys are plotting against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and then he goes and tries to protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But then the Abu Talib dies, salamullahi alayhi, and therefore Quraysh now can do whatever they want. What I would like to inquire from Muslims, if they can show me credible historical references that the tribe of Bani Tamim of Quraysh and Bani Adi were ever allowed to enter into Dar al Nadwa. To the best of my knowledge, they were not allowed to enter it, which means they were of the no class. They were of the lower class. And hence, it is these tribes that really tried and strived, or people of these tribes at least, who put in the effort to take the Khilafah after Rasulullah so they can establish a name for themselves. And indeed, they succeeded. And hence, the names of these tribes became popular in history. Otherwise, they would be just like any other tribe who were not recognized by Quraysh to be among the elites and the honorables. And they would not have ever been recognized in history the way that they did after taking the Khilafah. Now let's move to the Shia Hadith, which is more credible and authenticated because the companions narrated from the infallible Imams, peace be upon them all, and from the, the Prophet Let's look at one of the famous Shia scholars who narrates a hadith with this regard. And his name is Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi, the famous tafsir of al-Qummi. He lived in the time of Imam al-Askari So he actually witnessed some of the Amma, peace be upon them all, a trusty and honest narrator. Now the hadith reported by him, he said that the Prophet said to Hafsa, I will tell you a secret. If you reveal it, Allah, his messenger and the pious believers will curse you. So Hafsa asked, what is it? The Prophet Sallallahu he says, Abu Bakr will be able to seize the Caliphate and power after me, after the Prophet's departure from this world. And will be succeeded by your father as well, Omar. So Hafsa asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi who informed you 
about this? The Prophet replied, Allah, the Almighty, informed me. However, on the same day, Hafsa goes and she tells Aisha about the secret. So she betrays and tells the secret to Aisha. And Aisha eventually reveals the secret to her father Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr goes to Umar and he tells Umar to find out if Hafsa was really, I mean, heard what the Prophet said Sallallahu So he goes and checks Hafsa. Did you hear the secret from the Prophet Sallallahu She affirms and confirms. And he comes back to Abu Bakr and he confirms the fact that, yes, Hafsa also and indeed heard the secret from the Prophet Sallallahu So they all plot uh, and make a plan to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Tafsir al-Qummi, volume 2, page 367. There's another Mufassir amongst the Shia world, but he was actually a non-Shia scholar. He was a, a Sunni scholar before, and he converted to the Shia of Ahl Bayt and he wrote this tafsir, tafsir of Al-Ayashi, with the name of Mas'ud Al-Ayashi. He narrates from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, that the Imam was sitting with a group of his companions and asked them, the Imam asks his companions, do you know whether the Prophet died a natural death or was murdered? Allah, the Almighty, says, if he died or killed, the Imam brings this, this part of the ayah. The truth is that the Prophet was poisoned in his last days before he died. So Imam Sadiq confirms the fact that he was, he was poisoned and on his last days of his illness. It wasn't in the time of the 7th of Hijrah after the Khaybar battle by that Jewish woman, no just before days of his departure from this world. Now, the Imam also confirms and names those who assassinated the Prophet He says, Aisha and Hafsa administered poison in his food. He frankly mentions the names of the two wives of the Prophet Then, Ayashi, the Mufassir, he says that upon hearing this from the Imam, the companions, when they heard this matter from the Imam السلام, they all said that their fathers were amongst the worst people ever created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So imagine that even the Imam Sadiq السلام, confirms this fact that he was poisoned and by one of those closest members in his house, the two wives. This is mentioned in Tafsir Al-Ayashi, volume 1, page 200. In his final moments, they say that Sayyidah Fatima alayha, was with her father till the end, was by his side, and he would um, have conversations with her and then told her something, he called her very close and he was speaking very slowly, very quietly to her. He told her something and then she began to cry. Um, she was very saddened by what her father said to her. Then after a moment or two, the Prophet asked uh, her to come close again and wanted indicating that he wants to talk to her, say something in private. He talks to her and says something and all of a sudden she's very, very happy and she's smiling. Now what the, the scholars say that the dialogue that took place between the two was that firstly the Prophet told his daughter that my time is coming to an end, my time is coming to uh, a close and I shall be departing this earth soon and returning to my Lord which obviously upset her very much. Then he gave her the news that 
she's not going to be um, gone for long. That she, well, he won't be gone for long as she would be joining him very, very soon. So, um, that's, that's what made her very, very happy that she will not live much longer without her father because her father was very important to her. Her father was very dear to her and that she didn't want to be apart from, uh, from him for so long. And then, um, as the, the poison got stronger and the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got weaker, it came to a stage where he had fin- uh, finally um, breathed his last final breaths and departed from this world. He was covered with a Yemeni sheet and put into the side of, of, of the room. Uh, the women started to wail and cry and lament and mourn. And the men that were outside could, had understood from this that the Prophet had now departed. One thing people need to understand is that it was the request of Rasulullah that only Imam Ali, only one and his closest, and he said, Ali ibn Abi Talib is my closest, only he should wash my body and he should shroud me. So Imam Ali did this. He was the only one. He, he told everyone to leave and he gave the ghusl to the Prophet and he shrouded the Prophet and he would say, this is taken from Najwa Balagha, he says, O Prophet of Allah, I love you more than I loved my parents. Your death put an end to the prophethood, to revelation and to the messengers from the Lord. While death of our prophets had not resulted in this way. Your death caused a grief that every other grief was forgotten. The grief of your separation became common sorrow and everybody felt it. If you had not ordered us to be patient and not to lament and bemoan loudly, we would have kept weeping and lamenting ceaselessly. Though all the lamenting could not have compared with the actual loss of your separation. But death is an inevitable event. But death is an inevitable event. Nobody can turn death back and nobody can stop it from coming. Please remember us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. پشت یه سم جفا شد خاتم پیغم بران کشت یه سم جفا شد خاتم پیغم بران از غم هستی رها شد خاتم پیغم بران خوش ادا